Okay, I have 210 everywhere, so I might as well get started. <clears throat> was ever, anyone else at the bar last night? Because I, I felt I was talking over so many voices, and I think today my, my, my voice is a little bit rough, but uh, I had a really good time. So hope everyone else had a good time. Um, yeah, so I'm Chris Freed, um, uh, and I'm here to talk about uh, the POSIX roadmap for Zephyr LTS version 3. And actually, if I'm not mistaken, we have our LTS 3 uh, maintainer in the front row. I'm not going to point names or point fingers, name names, but maybe we'll chat later at some point. Um, these are some of the things that I've uh, been doing. It's like my kind of word cloud. Uh, I've been doing stuff like this for a long time. You know, going way back to like open embedded Gen 2 uh, uh, for a long time, essentially. Um, but within the Zephyr community, I'm a maintainer of the POSIX API. I actually have to write these things down because I'm forgetting them all the time. But uh, FPGA maintainer, uh, driver maintainer, I should say, hash utilities thrift, collaborator on C++, C, GPIO, IEEE 802.15.4, Texas Instruments platforms, uh, not yet part of networking, but I have done a bunch of networking stuff. Um, also, uh, because Meta is a, uh, a member of the, uh, the Zephyr project, I am lucky enough to have one of the seats on the technical steering committee. So if you guys ever have you know, issues that you need to escalate, then I'll be there and I'll be able to vote yes or no. Um, and here we go. Uh, if you're at the keynote this morning, I just wanted to point out my, Mario, uh, my manager, Mario, right here. <laughs> uh, he did a great talk on some of the things that we do at Meta with Zephyr. Um, which is amazing because we haven't actually been able to talk about that publicly until recently. So, of course, uh, MSVP, that's our uh, first in-house ASIC developed at Meta. And of course, like, why would we need a video transcoder? Uh, we have over 2 billion global daily active users, and it's still increasing. In terms of monthly, it's a third of the world's population. So. People love CAD videos. I'm just saying that, you know, like we've got to keep up. So uh, this is um, a link to our actual published document about that, describing that from engineering. Uh, and then of course, um, we have a high demand for this sort of thing. So um, just sorry, if readjusting one second. Um, in terms of numbers, we have 4 billion views of videos per day on Facebook. So that's a lot. And, uh, you know, how does that affect our systems? Well, that's a huge amount of power consumption, you can imagine. Transcoding, different resolutions, that sort of thing. Um, uh, storage, I mean, obviously the better uh, uh, trans, uh, sorry, the better codecs give you better storage metrics. So, and of course, performance. We don't want our CPUs just you know, mindlessly burning through cycles for no reason. So let's use an ASIC because that's how we accelerate things in the infrastructure world. Um, so yeah, uh, with our ASIC, um, we've achieved 9x faster throughput for H.264, which is great. Uh, 50 per, 50x faster throughput for VP9 encodes. Uh, and then of course, uh, six times better performance for high quality video on demand. The big thing for me, because I, I, I ride my bike, I, you know, bit of a friend of the environment, but this, to me this means a lot, and power consumption is down significantly, uh, which I think is a big deal, so. Obviously we have a next generation coming in, and that'll support the next video codec called AV1. Additionally, we have our uh, uh, AI inference accelerator ASIC, uh, version one. So of course, you know, we still get the same uh, load of users, but why do we use AI in the first place? So basically just your news feed, relevant ads, uh, you know, like ranking, that sort of thing, uh, you can imagine. Um, so uh, the reason that we need to accelerate this uh, in terms of uh, hardware is because, again, like power, uh, storage, and uh, efficiency. So. These models, uh, and I should mention too that uh, at the time, Facebook, but now Meta, we released a, a paper way back when that was not, I'm not talking about last week, but many years ago, 
And it was actually one of the, I would say, seminal um, publications about uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, so I wish I had a link for you, but um, I just learned about this last, last week in a meeting. So, um, but apparently we've influenced a lot in terms of AI. Um, so in terms of numbers, uh, compared to you know, the popular GPU of today, I'm not gonna name names again, but uh, we're getting two times the efficiency uh, in terms of uh, power consumption. Uh, and of course, we want to enable this for our users. So uh, we've open sourced PyTorch, there is PyTorch 1.0, uh, now there's PyTorch 2.0, uh, which is, I believe, a Linux Foundation project as well. And if you want to read some more technical details, aside from what Mario delivered in his keynote this morning, uh, you can check out the ISCA paper that was last week. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have a lot of links in my slides, so please download the slides if you want to get a direct link to the information. So what are we talking about today? An overview, uh, goals for LTS version 3, uh, and then I'll give you a bit of a status update, and then what's next. This is, the next slide is potentially like a little bit boring. Uh, you know, it, it all started way back with uh, Bell Labs, of course, right? Uh, C and Unix were very closely tied together. Um, and of course, uh, once uh, Bell Labs was able to prove that this was portable via the C programming language, it just kind of caught on like wildfire. So we had licensees left, right, and center. Um, I'm not gonna read all of them, but I'm gonna point out Alexander's gonna hate me for this, but this little guy right here, 1991, of course. <laughs> and of course, FreeBSD, I'll mention FreeBSD too, but yeah. There were a lot of really great ones. These are the two uh, that I consider my personal favorite in terms of uh, desktop operating systems based on Linux, or Unix, I should say. Um, and then of course, we had, before we had POSIX, we had the single Unix specification, which would have been 1996 approximately. Um, and then that later became POSIX. Uh, so IEEE standard 103, 1003.1. Um, originally released in 1988. And of course, talking about standards, you know, there's, as, as POSIX has evolved, so as C and C++, uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, I'm no like math expert, but uh, if I look back on this, and I did a little bit of numbering and stuff like that, um, to me that indicates that this year, uh, POSIX has turned 35 years old. So, if anyone wants to guess, over, under, over, under, over? Yeah, I'm over, I'm over, I'm older than that, so. <laughs> uh, and also, I'm no math expert, but that also means uh, this year, uh, Bell Labs Unix turns 50, which is pretty amazing, in my opinion. Get back to that in a second, but, uh, and this is, I should specify, this is since the uh, official uh, uh, public release of it. Now, let's look at Zephyr. Uh, Anas gave a really great overview of the history of, of Zephyr. Now, I'm just going to do an overview of the history of POSIX and Zephyr uh, really quickly, if I can. So, just looking for my mouse. It's somewhere. And I can't find it. Oh, here it is. Great. Um, so, of course, uh, 2015 was kind of the original uh, first commit, if you will, for, for Zephyr in its current incanta incantation. The Sockets API was introduced by Yuka Rasmussen, who is still involved in the project. Uh, he's no longer a network maintainer, but takes a very active role, uh, really great person to talk to. Uh, of course, the Socket API is BSD Socket, so Intel introduced the File System API in 2016. Uh, K poll similar to the poll was 2017. Uh, again, 2017 we got uh, more official Sockets API support, and that was via Paul Sokolovsky, who is incidentally the previous POSIX maintainer prior to me. Um, and then we had pthread support added by Andy Ross in 2017. Lenaru we added get adder info again by Paul Sokolovsky. Uh, Oticon uh, added the POSIX Arch native POSIX support. That was uh, Alberto Escalar Pietras. Um, 2018, POSIX clocks, Intel, uh, POSIX timers, Intel, 
MQ, Intel, pthread key, pthread once, again, Intel, <laughs> mutex, Intel, all 2018. So you can see it's kind of exploding. Uh, things kind of caught on. Um, finally, uh, the, uh, the POSIX API configurable, they're like, yeah, we have a POSIX API, maybe we should put a K config symbol for that, uh, 2018. So things were starting to really escalate. Select, et cetera, et cetera. Um, event FD, technically not POSIX, but kind of fits into the same basket, so that was added 2019. I added socket pair, uh, and I'll get into the details of this a bit more, but uh, POSIX thread support, not technically compliant because we don't automatically allocate our thread stacks. I made a couple attempts, and it's been several years. Uh, I'm gonna touch on that a bit later. Um, but other things, you know, there, there's some additional, uh, you know, additions over time. Um, rewrite of event FD, which is really useful for us internally. Uh, P threads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just really wanted to reduce technical debt, so that was one of the things that I tried to uh, get done. You might ask yourself, why? Why POSIX, right? Uh, well, basically just like portability. Um, a lot of people believe that POSIX is specific to Unix, and that's actually why it ends in IX, which is wrong, right? It just stands for Portable Operating System Interface. And if I had chocolates to throw out at people, I would be quizzing you, but I'm not gonna do that next time. <laughs> um, so uh, the reason we like portability is because if you have to incorporate a third-party library into your code, you want it to just work. You want it to adhere to a standard. You don't want any unexpected surprises, essentially. Um, and additionally, it's a mature API. That means there's a lot of developers who are familiar program POSIX APIs, and uh, that means your hiring pool is bigger. Um, reduced time to market is another reason. Yeah, so I mean, why else? Um, well, nowadays, Linux at least, but other operating systems like QNX are powering cars. Uh, I'm just guessing one billion, but you know, it's just a wild guess. We actually have automotive grade Linux happening at this event too, so I'm sure there's an expert that knows that exact number. Uh, that's not me. <laughs> um, we're powering two billion desktop, laptop, and this is a, uh, I, I know this looks like a printer, but I really wanted this to indicate print servers, so uh, that's also pretty old, probably like over 35 years old. Like, who, who remembers print servers? Probably a few of you. <laughs> um, interesting connection there, but um, lastly, 16 billion mobile devices, that's cell phones and tablets. Now just uh, putting it out there, I'm not trying to start a war or anything, but that's about 71% Android, just, just stating a fact. You know, the rest is iOS. There's another 1%, uh, who would that 1% be? Uh, I guess like Windows, oh, Blackberry. Blackberry was the other one. I should have remembered that, oh well. Uh, I should have remembered that faster. Anyways, so onward. Um, what are our goals for LTS v3 with POSIX? Uh, originally, if you checked out the RFC that this was based on, and I did a talk in January at the architecture meeting, um, you would have seen um, quite a mishmash of tickets and references to odd things, and that was basically because we were just collecting a list of uh, areas that where people thought we needed to do some work. So high-level goals. We just want to be able to maintain it better. Uh, we want to improve the interface for applications uh, and the implementation. And we want to improve portability, as I said. So um, that's really just it. Um, now, uh, in terms of the interface, there's one particular area that's, um, actually, I'll get into that later. Um, but yeah, so uh, maintainability. Uh, one of the things that I worked on personally was uh, getting rid of the structure details, i.e. implementation detail for things like pthread mutex, pthread uh, con uh, condition variables, uh, pthread itself, all sorts of things. And what we did is instead of uh, giving a struct to users that they would then declare within their stack or whatnot, uh, maybe statically, uh, we just gave them an integer. And then we had an array of uh, internal things that, that we could keep track of uh, you know, create, destroy, that sort of thing. Uh, and that actually gives us pretty fine control over the number of resources that we're using. Um, of course, uh, the synchronization primitive, for me, that was a big deal. So internally, if you'd ever looked at uh, the implementation of pthreads or mutexes or condition variables within the Zephyr project, it was kind of like dogfooding itself. So it would have like a 
that's not this diagram, but if you looked at pthreads, it would like, pthreads was implemented with pthread mutexes rather than kernel mutexes. And to me, that was a layering violation. So it increased the cost associated with maintainability. Yes, it was a dog booting as well. And of course, uh, we have kind of things existing where they're not supposed to. So we have libos FD table, which is this really great structure. If you're familiar with Linux kernel development, you've got your file operations, read write, ioctl, uh, map, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's something that we're trying to kind of fork out into its own uh, library. And the reason for that is because if you check out this diagram, you know, it's, this is my best artwork here. It doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> uh, but we had a, actually a cyclic dependency between POSIX and network. So uh, the way to eliminate that is you move that off into a common dependency. Um, so for lack of a better word, I'm just calling that ZVFS because it's like a virtual file system for files, but it's also for file descriptors and you can kind of implement you what you want. And if you need to extend the file descriptor table, it's really easy. Like, I mean, really easy. <laughs> um, I'm hoping that one of my metamates here can actually implement that soon, because it's a pretty interesting and challenging project. And of course, this is the biggest one, in my opinion. Um, the fact that uh, the, the POSIX architecture in Zephyr is mutually exclusive with the POSIX API. That seems really counterintuitive. You, you gotta think like, well, if I can't use POSIX on POSIX, then how am I gonna test POSIX? You know, like I have to use Kimi or I have to you know, run it on a board or whatever. Um, it seems kind of counterintuitive, but uh, I was really uh, pleasantly surprised to learn that um, Alberto, uh, who's now at Nordic, is uh, actively working on that, and I think we'll have that done very, very soon. Um, get some details about that later. So in terms of uh, the interface, of course, um, here we have our typical layer diagram. If, if you're wondering what these acronyms mean, then uh, you're probably not alone. PSE 5.1, does anybody know what that means? PSE, PSE, PSE? Oh, yes, there was one. Okay, so it stands for POSIX uh, Embedded Profile. Um, 5.1 is uh, what they call the minimal specification. 5.2 has some additional features, such as um, the file system. Um, and so on and so forth. BSC SOC is its own thing, but basically um, we want to, we, I think one of the goals, and I'm specifically gonna say I'd like to achieve uh, PSC 5.1 for LTSv3. I know we have BSC sockets already and we already have file system, but I'd rather do a little bit and hit that target and then maybe we can do a little bit extra. We'll see how it goes. Um, so just, for informational purposes, uh, LTSv3 is likely early 2024. So it's on the wiki. So one thing that happened recently was, uh, as well, we include, uh, we created this, um, sorry, I have this backwards on my slide. It's not POSIX Zephyr Uni Standard .h, it's Zephyr POSIX Uni Standard .h. So we prefixed all of our includes with Zephyr and then of course, if you wanted to include the POSIX thing, then you'd have to say not only POSIX, yada, 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 but also Zephyr POSIX, so on and so forth. So to me, that was an annoyance. And that was basically like a, a showstopper for anybody who wanted to use a third party library and didn't want to modify it. So that needed to be changed. Um, of course, uh, one thing that we don't do as well is what I refer to as uh, uh, activate uh, POSIX features, such as you know, headers, type definitions, and that sort of thing using uh, uh, the feature test macros, uh, such as uh, POSIX timers over here. Um, but this is actually the way that all of the existing POSIX toolchain editors uh, are, are configured. So um, newlib, uh, you know, uh, newlib minimal profile or whatever it is, uh, picolibc, uclibc, like they're all basically the same in terms of following that uh, sort of approach. Um, one of the issues that I feel is a bit contentious, but um, we probably do need to address because we will be supporting third-party tool chains that probably don't support POSIX. They're not going to provide us the declarations that we need. So that leaves it to Zephyr to actually supply those headers, which is 
what do you do in that case? That means you have to copy them, which is kind of an annoyance, but that's the option that we have right now for, for lack of a better run. Uh, so here we are gonna jump into a deep dive right here. Uh, actually, this document, I'll provide, I'll update the slides with the link to it. Um, but it's uh, from the Austin group meeting. And this, obviously this isn't quite the eye chart, so I apologize. But uh, we've got basically PSE 5.1 in the left, 5.2 in the second left, and so on and so forth. There's 5.3, 5.4, uh, and then it also covers desktop profiles. If you can squint really, really tightly, uh, you'll probably see that uh, uh, the shell is a requirement for the embedded profile, a POSIX compliant shell. And I'm just thinking, are we ever gonna get to that? I, I don't know why this was included in that profile, but uh, in any case, I think we're probably gonna exclude that from our, our work. Um, On to interface. Oh, sorry, that's backwards, my, my bad. Um, so just going, I'm gonna try and run through these things as fast as possible, but um, these are the uh, features, uh, feature macros or option requirements that are required in order to achieve PSC 5.1. Uh, so single process, that's sysconf, few names, sig add set, sig del set, sig empty set, oh, that's signal. Yeah, wrong set slides. Um, I'm gonna copy this over there really quick. Apologies, ah, I'm gonna skip that. So we've got single process. Out of that, we probably just need sysconfig or sysconf, which is really handy for static uh, configuration of your application. Can be done at compile time. Uh, and uname, which is also just kind of informational. We don't really need uh, an environment in Zephyr, like we don't need to store environment variables, so that just seems unnecessary. Uh, POSIX signals, you, you might think, well, signals are only process to process, but that's actually not the case. You can send a signal to a specific thread and you can receive only specific signals for a specific thread, so this is something we'd like to support as well, and for the most part, this is actually not that difficult. Um, obviously, there's going to be some exceptions, uh, like alarm, pause, raise, whatever. We're not going to kill the whole Zephyr uh, R RTOS because of a signal that we've received. So probably not going to implement that part uh, because we're not supporting multiple processes. Uh, thread base. Uh, you might think, well, this is practically done. It is almost practically done. Um, but some of the things that we're missing, uh, even though we never spawn another process, is at fork. Like, we're never gonna spawn another process, but the implementation of that, even if it's not linked to, uh, would help us to achieve that sort of compatibility. Um, additional barrier attributes, uh, also trivial to implement. Get p shared, set p shared. Uh, this is kind of interesting, pl slightly less trivial to implement. Uh, clean up push, clean up pop, uh, a little bit complicated. I think we'd have to statically allocate resources for that, so it would involve the kconfig. Uh, pthread kill is how we send a signal to another thread. Um, and then sigmask is how we ignore certain signals for a thread. Uh, cancel state, test cancel, uh, already talking with Keith Packard, who's the Pico libc maintainer about implementing that. Uh, clock selection, this is actually a really important topic because Everybody wants nano sleep. Everybody wants really high resolution timers. Uh, and that's just not for the application. It's for things like radio. Uh, I don't know if we have Florian here in the room, but he's implementing uh, TSCH for 802.15.4. Uh, that's like a direct use of that. Uh, but basically any highly reliable system has to have pretty reliable clocking. Um, Things like set clock, get clock, you can do that for multiple clocks. So we've got the real time clock, which is like your calendar date and time. And then of course you've got monotonic, which obviously you probably wouldn't want to update, but that's actually pretty uh, important for, um, for uh, you know, getting your uh, accurate, nanosecond accurate time. Um, let's see, so in terms of the pthread conda atter, that just means that if you're waiting for a specific mutex or something like that, I wanna use this specific clock. So I wanna use monotonic, uh, which would be the normal case, I would think. POSIX shared memory objects. Uh, why would I need this? Why would I need to do mmap <laughs> on a microcontroller system? Uh, 
it's mainly for compatibility, but I was actually discussing the other day, this has a interesting application for GPIO because right now, uh, if you look at the time it takes to write a GPO uh, in Zephyr, it's like milliseconds because you're going through a syscall interface. We need like fast, 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 fast GPIO reads and writes. Um, shared memory open, shared memory unlink. Uh, again, like, why would I use this? I don't know. <laughs> uh, sharing memory via file descriptor. It could potentially have a use. Um, CPU time. So this means uh, having CPU specific clocks. So measuring very fine, with very fine accuracy, how many cycles you spend in the thread. Uh, that could be used for statistics. Uh, I think that a lot of, of the uh, tracing uh, programs that are out there will likely need to have uh, accurate time reporting. And today, if you look at a, a Linux system, most of this is done for you by the libc. And a lot of this is how they work. So, um, so again, uh, POSIX timers, we covered this a little bit. But right now, the only thing we're missing is getting the resolution of the clocks that we support. Um, but go, kind of hand in hand with that is like, how do we know out of the 18 timers that we have in our system, which one we want to use for our real time clock, which one do we want to use for our monotonic timer, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, so the proposal that I have right now is uh, adding device tree chosen uh, nodes. And so you're thinking, well, if we want POSIX to work on every system out there, what do we do? Do we make these device tree nodes mandatory? Uh, and that's actually kind of the irony of it. Uh, we can't make device tree chosen nodes mandatory. They have to be opt-in. So it will probably involve a bit of uh, uh, legwork with all the different vendors and manufacturers, but I think it's something that we can get done pretty easily. Uh, again, I mentioned this earlier, but time synchronized channel hopping for 802.15.4. Florian, who's kind of working on that RFC, has a very strong desire to do this. Now, would we do this at the POSIX layer? No, why? Because we want POSIX to be a very, very thin wrapper around the Zephyr core features. So again, just like uh, kernel threading is, uh, we want to make uh, the timers just kind of a layer within Zephyr that we already use. So that would imply things like K clock monotonic, K clock real time, um, and then just adding the uh, constants for the POSIX subsystem. So how are we doing? Since becoming maintainer, um, after six months, I got nine out of the 16 tasks in my RFC complete, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, again, a link to the 2023 January slides from the architecture meeting. Um, so yay. <laughs> Since becoming maintainer, uh, after 10 months, I improved event FD read and event FD write by a factor of 10 and eliminated a deadlock scenario that was causing a lot of problems, even in Thrift. So like, if you were using Thrift a while ago, sorry. <laughs> um, yay. There was only just one minor bug, and actually, uh, Mar uh, Marcin Niastro, he, uh, he submitted the fix for that very shortly after. So that would be in 341, for those who are curious. Um, again, here we are. Uh, sorry for the eye chart, but this is just kind of your typical uh, Z-test output. Uh, this is for the pthread pressure test, so you can run it today uh, on various architectures and on hardware. Uh, after 11 months, I, uh, in I increased the performance of pthread create and pthread join back to back in a stress test by an almost infinite amount because previously it crashed, so you can actually measure it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's um, that was fun. It was fun to work on. It took me a couple of revs, but we got it running and it required some help by Andy Ross. And in the process, we discovered some sub, uh, sub problems within the kernel threads themselves. <laughs> oh, this is, I don't know why I have this here, but. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, sorry. This is the, uh, the pineapple poo emoji again, sorry. <laughs> and if you look at these numbers, how does this, how does this make sense? Like, so it's been a year. It's since a year ago I became maintainer. And why do, why do these numbers look so bad now? It's like 17 out of 54 tasks. How does that work? Um, 
according to the RVC, I, I mean, you can click on it right now. Anybody can check it out, but um, it wasn't actually uh, a, you know, a problem or anything. We just broke down the complex tasks into smaller, more manageable ones. And that's actually a really good thing because uh, now we're at about 70% completion for everything. If we take all those pretty trivial functions uh, and, and you know, complete them. So um, I'm gonna get some help, I'm hoping, so. The next thing, uh, dynamic thread stacks. If you are at the thread uh, thrift talk yesterday, I made an important announcement, but uh, I've been working on P threads for a while. I mentioned that in the timeline. Um, literally yesterday morning, I got an email uh, because I've been collaborating with Intel a little bit on this. And uh, Flavio, who's our security guy, emailed me and said the test suite is all green. That means we have uh, POSIX threads running with automatic stack allocation. That means it's done according to the POSIX uh, specification. So um, to me, that's a big deal. I'm gonna say it's a big deal and I'm raising my hands. So uh, I hope everyone else is excited as I am, but I've spent a lot of time working on this. So like four years, I did it as part of a contract a long time ago. And ever since joining Meta, it's been just like, here in my spare time, here and there. Uh, but to me, this is a big deal. It means P threads, ISO C11 threads, uh, C++ 11 threads, standard mutex, standard condition variable, counting semaphore, binary semaphore, all of those things, lock guards, all the really cool things that you can do with C++. Um, so if you have lots of RAM and you want to compile your C++ population, then you're good to go. Um, then it, it opens the door for other languages, such as Rust, or Python, or Lua. You know, like Lua is a kind of a cool little language that you can put on a microcontroller. Same with Zig, which was demonstrated last year, actually. Um, so how are we doing this? We're doing this with uh, a separate uh, kernel level API called kthread stack allocate and kthread stack free. Now, you might be asking, well, what if I'm like in safety critical, you know, I can't do any sort of malloking or, you're gonna be safe, you're gonna be fine. Um, and sorry that you work in safety critical too, but you know, like everyone's been there. So um, this same API will cover both heap based allocations and pool based allocations. So that means it will, underneath the pool based allocator, it'll just be a static uh, array of threads, stacks that you can, that you can, you can pick from. So you'll always have a, a maximum number that will be running at any given time. And that's the important part. Um, Additionally, with this, there's a configurable for, if you wanna have both, you can actually uh, choose the order. So if you wanna have heap stack allocations first, then you can do that. But if you wanna have pool stack allocations first, then you can do that. Um, and of course, you can have none of those. So you can still use the statically defined thread stacks and it all works. Um, yeah, so coming soon, uh, I don't wanna, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to, you know, say it's done because it still requires a bit of integration, but we're pretty much there. Again, uh, Arch POSIX, POSIX API, that's another big thing that we want to get out of the way. Uh, and as I said, Alberto Escalar is working on that. Uh, he put up an RFC only a couple weeks ago and managed to get pretty unanimous approval and he's going ahead, he's doing it. He's been part of the project for a really long time, if, if you recall from the history of POSIX and Zephyr. So it's been quite a few years. And uh, I remember, I, I'm sorry, Alberto, I know I've been a thorn in your side, but I've been requesting a lot and you know, from the native POSIX subsystem, and I really appreciate it. Uh, he's adding two, two new boards, one's uh, native SIM, one's native SIM64. Uh, as far as I know, these will be alongside the existing native POSIX, native POSIX64. So, and that's the way we do things. We wanna have a, a, a stable transition, um, and so on and so forth, so. So, um, currently I have zero collaborators in POSIX, and I'm just saying like, we're hiring. I, I'm not gonna give you any money, but like, please, please help. <laughs> um, I'd even take a co-maintainer, honestly, um, but, the nice thing about breaking things down into smaller, more manageable tasks is that for new people to Zephyr, this opens up a huge list of uh, really simple intro bug fixes or enhancements that they can add. So um, here we are. 
Here's a list of uh, the really trivial things from my perspective that we can add. And I actually have a RFC available right now for sysconf. Uh, other things like uname, pretty trivial. Uh, flipping bits in a signal set, pretty trivial. Uh, barrier destroy, barrier init, pretty much no ops. Um, get piece shared, set piece shared. That basically just means uh, limit what process can cross this barrier, or sorry, what thread can cross this barrier to a specific thread. So uh, again, it's pretty trivial. It just means an extra field within the barrier. Uh, of course, guarded by a K config, because we don't want to add that if we don't have to. Um, another thing I'd really like to add uh, that's not necessarily hanging fruit is K config control of all of the POSIX feature test macros. So the bigger items that are you know, getting us from 70% to 100%, those require a little bit of extra effort. And uh, obviously, as the maintainer, I'm going to do that. But I'm also enlisting help. So if you're a POSIX guru, please come and talk to me. Uh, I need collaborators. Uh, and yeah, that's basically it. So uh, with that, I'm going to open up for questions. And I think we have five minutes left. Uh, oh, <laughs> is there a mic? Oh, there's a mic right here. I, I, can uh, I think they want to hear you online, though. I can repeat the question if you prefer, but. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Josh has volunteered himself as the runner. <laughs> OK, so question one is um, for somebody who doesn't need this, all of this can be compiled out? I, I Absolutely. Think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Everything. OK. And second question is, is there a free version of this code that you can heavily borrow from while doing the? Uh, that's, a, that's a bit of a tough question. So one of the things about Zephyr is that we want everything to be Apache 2 licensed if possible. So that means, I mean, we can pull in a BSD3 uh, or BSD2 implementation, but then we need to get, we need to get uh, TSC approval if we pull that in. I've just been informed that we only have one minute, so maybe one or two more questions? Oh, three minutes. Okay, three questions. Uh, anyone? We've got a question in the in the back there. And in a, oh, Maurice as well. Uh, does with the, the dynamic thread stacks does MPU work? Yes, that's right. So that's exciting. The dynamic thread stacks that was the biggest thing. I, I basically hit a wall, and uh, I'd only been able to work on this here and there for months. Like it'd be six months between when I had a chance to work on this. So. What happened is that I, I did a rev with some uh, feedback from some reviewers and draft, and then I broke my own diff, which was really sad, uh, and I hadn't touched it for a while. I spoke with the NOS, and he said, like, oh, Flavio needs this really bad for something we were working on. So I'm like, oh, okay. Get in touch with Flavio. Two days later, he's like, you put an IFDAF right here. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's it. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's amazing Like when you, when you step back a bit, you get a couple of extra eyes on the problem. You can, you know, you can get there. Um, question right here. Yes. Um, maybe you have already mentioned during your talk, but do you use some kind of official conformity test? There is one. Um, it costs money and not monopoly money and not the money that I have on my credit card. So <laughs> uh, it's something that the Zephyr project might consider if this is something that's val valuable enough to our members. But I can't, you know. You know, promise anything, but there is a performance test suite. Yeah. Then how do you test to make sure that your code actually complies? Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. There's there's there are tons of POSIX test suites within Zephyr itself. Yeah. Uh, I thought you meant like compliance, actual like certification, but. But you make your you have your own. Test we we have our own. That's right. We have a pretty mature test suite. So. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, maybe one extra minute. Uh, I think we're good. So, okay, thanks everyone.